Drone Models Daily Vlog. Here we are on Tuesday's Q and A's on the 6th of October 2015. Um, as I said, not much building work going on straight at the moment. And to be honest, I'm filming this first thing on Tuesday morning. Uh, as you know, I'm helping my parents move, so you might not get this until a little bit later. So anyway, straight on with your questions. So the first one is from Matt. Uh, question, two questions for you, Phil. Uh, would you do a tutorial on how to use Flory sounders? I'm feeling I'm not using them to their full potential. Uh, yeah, of course we can. Um, generally, if you've got the full sets and you're laughing, as you know, we tend to do our skinny range uh, of all the bits and pieces. Find them. I really must change mine. You think we've got thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of sanders here. Um, I've got some real junky, horrible, rubbish ones. I ought to change them. Uh, tend to use the skinnies more than any of the others purely because it's less collateral damage okay so when you're sanding and things like that you can obviously get in there with the skinnies the four ones remember they are four uh, pound 95 for a pack of 12 um, and then obviously we do the big full set which we did have which hold on funny enough i have one from the prize draw over here <coughs> This one works out around about £37, I think. Members, you get a very good discount on this, where you get a full set of everything we do in there. So you get a full set of the sponges, I have three packs of the sunders, 12 of the skinny types, um, and the sheets, sanding sheets, and everything, the polish and buffers. What I'll do is, to be honest, this one is gonna be, um, it needs to be a very good finish. So we'll probably talk about sanding a lot in there, but certainly I can do at some point a standalone one on there, when to use them. I know a lot of people say to me about obviously when to use a sponge and when to use a normal flat one. I tend to use the flat one when I'm doing something I need to be dead flat. If I want it to have a slight curve, like a nose or something else around there, then I'll always use a sponge. But say we've got different grits, different types. You've got the standard blue, which is your all-rounder one. We've got the one which is like wet and dry paper. And then obviously on the back of that, which is designed to be used submerged or definitely with wet and with soap and stuff like that. Okay, so there is different ways of doing things. And by all means, give us a couple of weeks and I'll get something sorted. Uh, second one up is, do you ever get muddy residue at the bottom of your Tamiya Extra Thin? Suggestions on how to avoid it. Now, forgetting that one, because obviously that's my homemade brew, I tend to, this is mine here, I don't know how well you can see it. Mine has got a bit of, you can see it at the bottom there, a bit of gloop running around. What that actually is, is obviously because it's a weld action, a hot action glue, when you're brushing it on, it's actually melting and then scooping up like a brush, some of the soft plastic, okay? Especially if you do that of going over it a few times, that's all that's happening, it's in there. I wouldn't worry about it, to be honest, I don't. Um, what I tend to do though is a quick thing, here we go. I have various states of Tamiya Extra Thin bottles, which is my little tip for you. Uh, I've got an empty one, which is just because I'd like to use them for knocking up other things in. But also you might notice down here how full, I know it's difficult on the overhead and that, but you see it's like at half a bottle. What I tend to do is I keep it at half a bottle because what I find is if you've got too much on there, it can build up on the end, okay, here. And when you touch it, you end up with too much glue. With this gives me that, yeah, basically a perfect full brush full without it going up the actual stalk itself, okay? So like here is a classic example, I've got a big bulge of it there if you was to do it, and then that knocked down onto here, you'd end up with a massive run of it. So what I tend to do is, once I'd gone halfway through one, and to be honest, I've done it for absolutely the last 10 years of using this stuff now, um, is literally, I get to a certain level, and when it is, basically just a little bit lower than what it is now, half a bottle, I'll then top it up and I'll just put a couple of mil in there and a couple of mil and a couple of mil and I just keep topping up with it. The other thing is that I find as well, sometimes the brush tips are better, like forget that one, I now know why that one's there, um, is that uh, you know some of them have a flat or a slightly dodgy tip on it where some of them have a very nice sharp precise tip on the end of the actual brush so i tend to always use the same brush unless it suddenly gives up or whatever but they tend not to do it but definitely by keeping it half a level means you don't over glue anything and each time you top it down you go in and it's not like when you haven't got enough in there and you end up having to shake it slightly to get it up you don't have any of that trouble at all it literally can be a case of every time you get in there you get a precise brush full and away you go without overloading the brush so quick tip on that but as for the goo stuff i wouldn't worry about it it's probably because you've had it kicking around a while you get bits on there they fall off of the brush they end up causing a layer down the bottom if you wanted to you could use a pipette siphon them off put it into a newer bottle and away you go or decant it out for the minute clean it off with a bit of tissue down in there get it all out of the way and then put it back in but it won't harm anything because technically it's just this stuff which is our homemade brew at the very finest amount okay so it really help if you're gluing anyway 
So, okay, uh, ding ding. Okay, Nigel Wade says, Phil, great show as always. Nice to see the Space 1999 diecast. Please, please, please do not paint over anything near that vehicle. Leave it as it is. All those scratches are part of your history of your childhood. Plus, a lot of collectors will be screaming at the screen. Funny enough, I've had two people offer to buy that. Amazingly, who knew? I didn't even know it was worth anything. But I have had two people contact me asking if they can buy it. No, it's going to stay with me. And okay, I won't repaint it. I will probably keep it as it is. I'm just looking for it. It was here the other day. Here it is. For those of you who didn't see it the other day, uh, this is it. Have the Space 1999 Eagle uh, with the bits and pieces, which amazingly is complete, uh, and all the rest of it. So um, we did a kit review of, it's not here anymore, it's made its way over to my other stash uh, and everything else like that. Something that I'd like to do in the future, super detail it, bring it up to speed. But definitely fear not, I am not going to uh, go and uh, massacre that one. I think I'm going to leave it as it is, as I say, but I do want to do the other one now. Okay. Spectrum is green, definitely. See, that's definitely my childhood. Steve Lamb, uh, hi Phil. Um, I have a spare bottle of RLL 9004. Uh, is there a mix to make it into tire black? Love the show. Uh, I'm a born again modeler, having a few uh, more time now. Sorry. Uh, modeler having more time now after bringing up the family. Best way when they're older. Uh, right. Um, yes, you could. Literally with any black, if you want to take it off color, I know you're speaking about, I think last week's show we spoke about how I don't use black or white, I use a shade of, um, but don't get me wrong, I have still got a bottle of XF1 up there, and I think I've got some X1 over there as well for gloss work, but what I mean by it was we were talking about how I like to prefer to use things like tire black, and I do absolutely love, and that's why it's here, because I use it all the time, a bottle of this, this stuff, and this is the tire black, um, or rubber black, from Tamiya, beautiful color. We we're talking about props, stuff like that. Other manufacturers do them. NATO Black is a very close one to it as well. There's companies out there, we've reviewed them donkey years ago now, about six, seven years ago now, but um, Life Color do a range called Black, and it's literally different shades of black rubbers and things like that. Um, tire Black as well. You can make it up literally any way you want. What I would just recommend is, putting in a couple of drops of like a gunship gray or a dark gray. So if you're in the Tamiya line and I wanted to make something similar, I'd use XF1 mixed with something like um, an X F24, just a bit of gray in there. And what that does is just takes it a shade lighter, which gives you a better scale effect because just black is too strong, okay? And I think it's, it's a way to almost give that toy look and that's the trouble with toys because they have black and it, it, you just lose that scale effect with it the same with white being white it's too strong in nature unless you've got a brand new car you know that's white okay but give it a couple of years it's an off white as well okay so you get that slight bit of yellowing in there a little bit of grayness and dirtiness and it makes it look more lifelike and things like that so that would be my only type of thing to it classic example is when we're looking at the stormtroopers um, you've got a kit review of that coming up this week uh, when i was actually reviewing them and i explained about this is the whitest white i've ever seen because it is so unnaturally white it looks good but that's because it's on a sci-fi figure and you want him to be the brightest white possible you certainly wouldn't want that on your aircraft though or your car or anything else because it is too white uh, and something we were speaking about with gloss effects recently in lacquering one of the guys in the forum apologies i've got your name mentioned it called it the toffee apple effect absolutely perfect when i read that i thought that is it because it does if the gloss work is so shiny it looks like a toffee apple okay versus it being a scale look to it because that way it's just so thick in you know varnish or your lacquer or whatever it is it just doesn't look natural enough okay but as he said by cutting it back a little bit of polishing on there should give you the right effect and it's something i'm going to try with my rb6 probably later on in the week uh, so yes, from that point of view, going back on question, you could make it up. I would just suggest cutting it with a little bit of gray just to take it back. But basically just take any dark um, RLM color, your federal standard colors, things like that, and literally just give them a cut of dark gray. Don't suddenly put a bit of white in with them because you're gonna end up with gray. You just want it to keep a shade off uh, and work it like that. Uh, right, okay, Jarvis has seen, Jarvia, sorry, um, has uh, written in, hi Phil, uh, your site and videos are just addictive, thank you. My simple question is, would you ever build an airliner? I know many, uh, I know maybe they're a little bit boring because you don't have as much detail, but on the other side, you can be very hard to weather, getting the right gloss effect without it looking like a die-cast toy is not easy. 
uh, I would it would be nice to see an excellent modeler like you and go that far uh, working about on that thank you to be honest I've had loads of requests for doing an airliner um, literally I must have had honestly about 30 people now say you're going to do an airliner I've got close to it because we've done transport aircraft and things like that uh, in the past we've done things like C-160s um, um, this is where we cue the tweeting music or tumbleweed because you're right I haven't done that many as in a proper airliner um, yes in a word what I'll do is because I don't know if you've all noticed this year I've tried to do something a little bit different i.e Formula One we've done the uh, bike which let's face it we've never done one now in the last 10 years uh, and a few other bits and pieces which have been a little bit left a little bit right of normal field um, so it's something that definitely I'm going to get around to doing now nobody start I am not going to do a massive great Concorde or something else like that it will be a straightforward something or other um, and I'll make a decision on it uh, and go through it like that I always fancy doing something like a um, 747 the big 400 and 800 series that Hasegawa did. I did like those kits, things like that. I have done them, did a lot of them in the past in my commission days because people like airliners and things like that. Uh, but from a video point of view and being here on this side of things, then no, I haven't done one yet. So I will rectify that and we will get one on the go. Okay, Ken says, uh, hi Phil, I'm returning to the hobby after being away for 20 years. Uh, are there any basic kits uh, sorry, kit ma uh, makers of armoured fighting vehicles you would recommend that are good for getting back in the hobby. Um, I'm just looking uh, for kits that go together easy without many issues. Again, it's not like it used to be back in the 90s where it was like 50-50. Um, you go down the model shop and you look at it and it's a lovely box and you think that's great and then you find out it's got a 1970s thing in it. With armour, you can actually get some really good kits. Tamiya, all of them are really good kits. Okay, so you can go back and you look at it and it's like made in 1973 and you think, God, that must be horrible. Actually, not bad at all. I've built most of them over the years um, and they really are very nice. It depends on when you're getting back to the hobby you're saying how complex you want to take it. And obviously Steve, our armour god on the site, is probably a better one to ask than me. He knows the technicalities of them and all the rest of it. I would basically say if you're looking to go around and just get into armor again, things like that, then obviously have a look at Tamiya. You really can't go wrong with them. We've done it ourselves. Look at the Meng, Mong, Ming, whatever you want to call them now because everyone's got a different opinion. Uh, but have a look at the uh, Meng kits. They go together absolutely beautifully. We've done a couple of them. I've done a couple of them now, and they are absolutely great. We're going to be starting on the Terminator very, very shortly as well. So that'll be another great armor kit all the little um, problems uh, that kits used to have armor was never affected that well like you know wings just not going on uh, aircraft was quite common years ago now they've all gone basically armor never had massive fit issues because by its nature it's supposed to be clunky and robust and all the rest of it so you could just do a bit of filler in there and get away with it a lot easier but certainly these days as well, technology has come on. So then you're into the situation of, right, how much do you want to spend? Do you want to actually spend 70 quid on an armor kit because they're out there, you could do it. You could add a little bit of photo etch to it, a little bit of resin parts, some aftermarket stowage, things like that really to lighten them up. Or you can go just straight in like we did with the Bradley build. Have a look at the Bradley build. That was fantastic. Went together really, really well. The Sherman build we've done. Have a look at the video builds from them. Get an idea of how complex you want to take it, what you want to do. The Bradley was straight out of the box, you know. Um, the actual Sherman technically was straight out of the box as well. Uh, so no problems with those, but have a look around at them. Have a look at some of the guys' builds on the forum. Get a feel for how far you want to take it, how far you want to go. If you're getting back into it, I wouldn't recommend going down the aftermarket route and photo etch. Just build it, uh, get a feel for it. Get your techniques down for obviously painting and weathering and things like that, uh, rather than starting to go straight in at the deep end and go with some massive complex thing with aftermarket resin and all the bits and pieces in there, stuff like that. But definitely, if you, your budget is up for it, have a look at the uh, main kits. But really, you can't go wrong with anything from Tamiya. All the Tamiya kits, some of them are reboxes by the companies, but they've always used very good ones, such as the Tusker kits. They're absolutely fantastic. That's the Sherman that we used. Technically, it's in a Tamiya box, but actually, I did read somewhere they're reboxing, they're redoing the Easy 8 as their own as well. I think that's coming out soon as well. So, um, pretty shortly, you'll be able to do Tamiya's brand new version of it instead of using the Tusker kit and things like that. But definitely, you really can't go wrong with armor. They're always pretty good. Okay, um, Brett says, hi Phil. Um, 
Uh, I'm all uh, sorry. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to building the Meng MBT Terminator, which is down there if you can see it. Just about, I think. No, I don't think we can quite. Around. Cameras move slightly, uh, which I've got just behind me ready to go. Along with you during the upcoming video build, I uh, just love the look of this tank. Will you be getting any aftermarket parts for it? I love your builds, love the site, uh, love the daily vlog. I'm looking forward to, to the return of the live shows, no matter what form they take. Uh, keep up all you do for us, Phil. No problem, Brett. I don't know I'm going to go down the aftermarket. Definitely the tracks apparently are very, very good, so we don't have to worry about that. And I'm probably going to go down the lines of, it'll be more about, again, the painting and the weathering um, and doing all the bits and pieces to it. To be honest, our friends at AK have sent me some very nice bits and pieces. Um, and I've got some of their weathering sets here and stuff like that. I would like to try on it. Never used them before. That's why we're doing it there. I don't know if you remember, but we've taken different approaches with the last armor builds to do different ways with every build. Like we were saying yesterday's vlog, I try and do something different with every build. The last couple we've used oils. So we've gone out and we bought ourselves a cheap pack of oils, a little bit of thinners, and we've just been going through it like that. And we've got obviously the Flooring Models range of pigments. This time I'm going to try something a little bit different and we're going to use some off the shelf bought weathering products because let's face it, I've never used them. I think you don't need to use them, but a lot of people do. So I thought it's time for, you know, have a go at them, see if they're any good, see if they're worth the money and do it like that. So that's why the Meng's lined up so we can test some of the AK range, see exactly what they can do, see, you know, how far, how easy, you know, and value for money and all the rest of it. So that's what I'll be doing with that. But for physical aftermarket stuff, I don't think so. I think it's pretty much going to be out of the box. Just we're going to be using aftermarket weathering products on that one. Okay, right. Jan says, um, was it Olaf? I don't know. Jan Olaf? Okay, so hi, Phil. Um, I like the art presentation on, sorry, I like the art presentation on your Ducati uh, or even the RB6 using the electronic turntable. Uh, I want to do this before I'm looking for a complete course. Uh, I've tried the usual sources, eBay, Amazon, and so on, but without clear results. What type of turntable is it? Now, um, didn't we review one the other week? Well, I'd say the other week, probably months ago now, time flies. Um, basically, mine is in here. Let me just grab, I have two. Um, there's one. Let me just grab the other one. If something goes falling off of it. Right. Grab two. Okay, so these are the two I have. Excuse the dust. It's terrible. But you have having pets around here. This one here is the one I don't use because I haven't got a battery for it um, and I haven't tried it, but I did try it once. And the thing is, it's a little bit wobbly along the top. Now this is actually made by Master Tool, is it? Trumpeter's subsidiary company that does all the tools. Actually, it's quite cheap. I can't remember exactly how much it was. It's mirrored, but to be honest, it's like a foil stuck on. It's not like a proper glass mirror. So quite frankly, I'd probably either paint over it or stick something on it because it's not the best in the world. But generally, it works quite well. Its rotation is very good. My only thing is if you've got something heavy on it, it doesn't like it. And secondly, it has got a slight wobble because it has a pin obviously underneath which is driving this spinning round, okay? And as I said, I can't remember exactly what it was, but these are readily available. Trumpeter, have a look at creative models in the UK because this is where this one came from and all the rest of it. My one of choice, which is this guy is a really nice one because it's got wheels all the way around it. It keeps it incredibly steady. You can move the actual uh, gear on here and you can maneuver it around onto a different pin and it goes uh, fast, medium or slow on the spinning. It's battery or mains powered. Okay, and then this sits on here and then off it goes. And it's quite quiet to be honest and it's got a good speed. Although I must admit during post uh, editing I usually slow down the footage so you can get a little bit more of a clearer look because it does tend to zip around a bit quicker. Um, generally this one came from, again why does nothing have a, a name on it? <laughs> this one came off of eBay where are we? Slow on that one. Uh, this one came off of eBay uh, about 15 years ago. I bought it for displaying work at a show and things like that. Um, I can't remember it, but and also there is no maker's man. Oh, hold on a minute. There we go. This one is actually called, it's got it down here, Auto Art, made in China. 
Okay, so it's the little symbol there is an uh, there's an A with a uh, capital A, small a, auto art. So this is obviously who makes this one or something into it. But there is no maker's manufacturer or anything else written on this one whatsoever. Came off eBay and if I remember right, I paid about seven quid for it. But we are talking 10 years ago now. I'm not sure how much that one was, but um, it goes on. But let's say this one is like rock solid. Once the top's on, it doesn't actually wobble. This one is a bit, so when I'm filming it and I want to do the spin and the rotation we've been doing recently with all the after you know the final reveals that one it's a bit like this as it's going around this one's dead center uh, and no problem at all so um and i think it will spin with a lot of weight on it i don't know if you remember but we actually put the um the bradley on that huge bit of wood on there this one i think i tried it and it struck all this this one no problem at all it just carried on with it but generally as you say they are very very nice handy for displaying and if you wanted to you could plug them in they're not too noisy you know Yes, you can hear it. Yes, it drives you mad after time, but generally for what I do, it works really well. It's just that like I could do with giving it a clean up. But uh, if I remember rightly, I found it up in the loft some time ago and it was fallen over and got crushed slightly. So, but it has got a nice velvet top. Have a look on eBay. I don't know if some of the guys might be able to where to find one and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, very nice for displaying your models. Just remember the overhang. I've had it before where I've had a plane with a nose and it spun around and hit something, pit of tubes, things like that, every time. Okay, so last up, last question for today. Um, Robert asked, with a big old question down here, Hi Phil, after some help, uh, the last, um, at last I found some decals for my 148 scale a B24. Uh, uh, I, I got the kit nearly two years ago, uh, but there was no decals and a few bits have been started. But now on closer inspection, the nose turret has been glued together but there is a visible seam line. This is where hopefully my picture in picture editing might come in. Let me just show you down here. Uh, this is what we're talking about. Okay, so absolutely. Uh, chances are he's used normal glue in that one. Okay, I've no idea how to get rid of the seam as I can't fi uh, find any uh, uh ones that have tried the scene before got joy joy i uh, didn't try to separate the halves true don't try and separate it you'll crack it um i hope there's a way to really solve the problem right if it was me have a look at your references and then maybe put a seam this thing will have seams it's not just like a glass ball it is going to have some structure it's the b24 i don't know i assume it's the nose turret um you may be able to disguise it by having, you know, mask it and having a bar running over it. It will have one. They weren't just a solid bubble. Obviously, you've got the door at the rear and things like that. So you might be able to lose it in there. Now, my B24, which is a lot smaller, has one as well. Now, no one laugh because this one is very old, don't forget. <clears throat> and we won't talk about dust on the top, okay? But I think you're in luck. If you can see through the dust here, my B24, we've actually got, this is the old Minicraft kit. Now look, see, even better, it comes off. Right, let me just pop that down there, very safely. Now, yours, obviously, one-to-one -one scaling here, mine. So if I just get the dust off, if you put your seam like I've done on mine, it runs right the way around the top. That will hide that, and I do believe that's why I've done it on mine as well. I'm sure that is what it is. Go, no, don't start all that, there we go. Okay, so that is how I would cure mine. I've got a seam line running right around it, we've got the doors at the back, and then it's been put on and done just like that, okay, just the same way uh, as it goes forward. All right, so generally, I think that's how I would tackle it. Just polish it, Get rid of the actual dent in the seam itself, mask it, spray it, and job done. So look at that, you saved yourself a job because he's got one in there already, okay? Okay, that is about it for today. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, thank you, Cortana. That's the only trouble, don't talk to the PC. Okay, so that is about it for today. We're gonna to carry on with your questions and all next week. Thank you for joining us. So until tomorrow, everybody, happy modeling and take care. Bye.